Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be discussing nuclear instability. So what makes the nucleus of an atom unstable and likely to be radioactive? So what we're going to be talking about, about the, some of the particular characteristics that are going to make a nucleus unstable. We're going to focus on one of them which is called the proton to neutron ratio and looking at electron capture and beta decay as processes that atoms un will undergo if this is a problem for them and also atomic size. We're also then going to look at an, another type of radioactivity that can occur, which is called positron emission, something that is highly useful in the technique called positron emission tomography, or PET, a type of medical imaging technique. So what makes a nucleus unstable? What makes it likely to break down and release radiation to become more stable? Because that's what radioactive atoms do, that where that nucleus is unstable, it will break down, it might split completely, or it will break off certain chunks um, and release them either in the form of particles or in the form of high um, energy waves or gamma rays. So there's two main things that are characteristics of a nucleus that will help us to decide whether it will be an unstable or a stable isotope. The first one is the ratio of protons to neutrons inside the nucleus. And the second one is its sheer size or the atomic size. How big is the nucleus? How many particles, how many nucleons, you know, protons and neutrons, are we trying to accommodate together? So the first one that we're going to focus on is the idea of proton-neutron ratio. Okay, so what we have here in this diagram is it's showing you the, the ratio of protons to neutrons for a range of isotopes um, and whether they are um, stable or unstable and the ones that are unstable showing you the kind of process that they will undergo in order to achieve stability once again. So we only have a really thin um, area in the middle that we call the zone of stability which is this area where stable isotopes are going to be found. So where a specific ratio of protons and neutrons. Okay, If it's inside this that, that particular narrow um, ratio then it will be a stable isotope. If it's outside that narrow ratio, um, either to you know high this way or low this way, or um, significantly high kind of beyond the end here, it will undergo one of these um, radioactive decay processes in order to become more stable. Okay, so um, we're going to focus on um, these two in a, you know in the kind of this next section because that's um, they're the, the two kind of key processes that will happen when the ra this ratio is out of alignment or out of balance. Okay, so we've just saying that this, there is a particular ratio of protons to neutrons that is stable. Outside that ratio, it's unstable. Um, now, this ratio isn't fixed, or you know, it's it's not a directly proportional linear relationship that applies in every um, potential situation. It tends to it it does change as the size of the uh, nucleus increases. Okay, so when we have small atoms, so around about the um, atomic number of 20 or, or smaller, that tends to be a ratio of 1 to 1. So one neutron for every one proton. But as it, those isotopes get larger, then the ratio tends to be around about 1.5 neutrons for every one proton. Okay, so that, um, you, yeah, so that as you're getting towards that, that kind of end of the diagram that we were just seeing. Okay, now part of that is that as we add more and more protons, you know, we're getting up to, when we get to uranium, we're getting up to 92 protons to accommodate, um, that we need to make sure that those positive charges are insulated or protected from one another in order that the repulsion inside the nucleus doesn't cause it to break apart. So you need more neutrally charged neutrons to as a buffer to, to exist between those protons um, as that gets larger. When it's smaller, th then it's not quite as difficult to accommodate. Um, you still need those neutrons, but the, you don't need quite as large a ratio. Okay, so if it's above or below this stable ratio, it becomes radioactive. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at what happens when there's too many neutrons. Okay, so when the ratio of protons to neutrons is in favour of um, excess neutrons, what it does is it undergoes a process of called beta decay. Okay, we talked about beta radiation um, as a you know, beta particle as an electron, but this is the process that will happen in this situation. So what we get is a neutron. Um, inside the nucleus decays into forming a proton and an electron. And so then that electron gets ejected out of the nucleus um, as, as a beta particle. Okay, um, And then so we've um, 
we've switched from a neutron to a proton, so our atomic number has increased by one, but you'll notice that our overall mass number has not. Okay, we still have 137, but we've gone from cesium up to barium, 55 to 56 in this case. Okay, so this electron is not one of the orbiting electrons around the outside of the nucleus. It comes directly out of the nucleus itself, um, and, and that the process of, of converting these particles into one another is it's not an easy thing to understand. You don't need to, um, to sweat it at the moment. But this idea is that's where those particles originate. And in doing so, we've reduced one neutron, we've increased one proton, so the balance has shifted um, to, to more, um, a more stable environment. Now, what happens if we have too many protons or too few neutrons, if we want to look at it that way? We undergo a process called electron capture. So what this is involving is the nucleus of the atom actually capturing an inner orbital or, um, electron, or what's termed a sheath electron. Um, so capturing it from an inner orbital, um, and it's uniting or combining with a proton together to form a neutron. So it's sort of the opposite process of what we were just looking at. Okay, and so what that means is the same, you know, the same sort of outcome that we've reduced one proton and we've increased one neutron. So the balance has shifted back to being more stable. So it's all really about which side of that, that kind of equation or that, that balance is too heavy or, you know, is too large and then bringing it back to equilibrium. Okay, so that's that process called electron capture. All right, now what happens if our atom is just simply too large? Okay, so what, we, what happens is we undergo the process called alpha decay. We, re, we release an alpha particle, the helium nucleus. Now this occurs in atoms that have an atomic number greater than 83. They have no stable isotopes beyond that because their nucleus is so large that they have the tendency to undergo decay. And the alpha decay is the, pro the process that they undergo because it is allows the quickest reduction in atomic mass. So if the nucleus itself is too heavy, then ejecting a particle that makes up two protons and two neutrons stuck together will reduce that um, significantly. Um, more so than beta decay will, where you're actually not changing the mass number at all. Um, and so, you know, for example, here we've got uranium-238, one of the, the, the key um, radioactive isotopes of uranium and used in nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons. When it decays, it um, undergoes alpha decay to turn into thorium, okay? So we've, because we've gone from 92 to 90 protons, we've lost um, two, two neutrons as well, so we've gone from 238 to 234. Here's our alpha particle that has been emitted in this direction, and then there's also a significant amount of energy that comes out from that process as well. Okay, that's one reason why um, uranium um, is such so useful in this, these contexts. Okay, so it reduces the atomic size until we eventually get back down to a level that we reach to lead, which is atomic number 82, and then it stops. Our atom has become stable. Now, there's also one last kind of process, which is probably a little bit strange. It might seem a bit strange to you. It's called positron emission. Now, just a quick little bit of kind of recap, or we'll kind of bring you up to speed here, is that when we're thinking about the particles of matter in the universe, that we talk about protons, neutrons, electrons, you know, fundamental kind of particles. There are more fundamental particles than that, but, you know, that's, they're the sorts of ones we talk about. But the reality is that there are, so for every particle, a type of particle that makes up matter, there also exists a, an opposite side or the flip side of the coin type of particle, or what we call antimatter. Okay, so matter and antimatter, the particles that were popping in and out of existence, um, you, know, it, you know, very early on in the development of the universe. And so that, um, and what that kind of brings us to talking about these, these particles called positrons. So a positron, is the antimatter equivalent of an electron. Okay, so when we're talking about matter and antimatter, that they are identical in, in all respects except they're opposite in one key um, area. Okay, so an, a positron has the same mass and other characteristics as an electron, but it has a positive charge. Okay, so a relative charge of plus one rather than minus one. So when we're writing in a nuclear notation, like we've been learning a little bit, uh, we will be looking at in this sort of thing. Um, so we would write it like this, with a zero and a one, and then the E for electron. And so positron emission is a, a process that can happen um, that then, um, when we're taking a proton and it decays into a neutron inside the nucleus. And so what it, it, it does, it gives out this 
positron during this process. So rather than giving out an electron, that it actually gives out a positron instead. The mass number stays the same, the atomic number decreases rather than increasing like it does in beta decay. Okay, so positron emission and beta decay are kind of companion sort of processes that they're, they're kind of the flip side of each other. Now, the, only, the main reason that we're, we're looking at this is that positron emission is one other way that atoms can become more stable or can achieve more stability, um, but it also has great use in medical um, the medical field. We've developed a technology called positron emission tomography. So tomography is kind of like the measurement of a slice. Okay, so if we're talking about... Um, a CT or a CAT scan, you know, computerized tomography, this idea of actually looking at imaging um, of, of things in a medical field by making very thin slices and then actually looking at each of those, those slices, those cross sections. So we're using, we're not going to go into the, the specific technology very much, but just seeing that actually looking at the behavior of positrons allows us, um, it, and the way they interact with tissue gives us a way to um, image different um, parts of the, bo the patient's body. So that's kind of where it applies. All right, so we talked about what makes a nucleus unstable, the fact that it's to do with either the proton-neutron ratio or atomic size, that depending on exactly which way the proton-neutron ratio is shifting, that it will either undergo electron capture or beta decay. And if it's atomic size, um, we will undergo alpha decay. And we also talked about positron emission as another way that atoms can become more stable, which has relevance in positron emission tomography. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.